Hey guys, Rich with Rich Rebuilds here, and there will be three categories to this episode. Number one, planning and fabrication. Number two, oh no baby, that's not me. And number three, my all-time favorite, thickly laid sarcasm with an ad that you won't see coming. So, which one should we choose with our spinning wheel here? All right, what do we have? Ah, sarcasm with an ad that you won't see coming. All right, so apparently over 10,000 engineers watch the channel and they all came out of the woodwork for the last episode and I've been getting lots of feedback on what I'm doing and people stated there'd be lots of unsprung weight, I didn't make the handling impossible and I would have no suspension travel rendering it useless. Useless! Now I do take into account professional opinions or I find people of experience and knowledge. When I first rebuilt the Tesla there was no one so I'd either become that guy that fixed the Tesla or win a sweet Darwin Award. Now I find archaic ways of doing things, but I'm the kind of guy that works with what you have. I have a really big battery. Most of you may have smaller batteries you wouldn't understand. So I had no room for the motor, and this is the method I came up with to resolve the problem that I encountered. So let me read some comments here. What's this? Okay, Fred told me I have no room for suspension travel anymore. Well, why didn't I think of that, Fred? Well, Fred, I did try it beforehand, and I did consult a few professional ATV riders on how far the travel would go if I wanted to do some sweet jumps. I thanked Fred, asked what his last project was, and he said he collects baseball cards, and that's really cool. Thank you, Fred. Next one up, the welding skills of me and my constituents will fail miserably. This comes from Charles. Well, Charles, I beat my electric rat rod up pretty bad. It can actually tow my Hummer. I put it through its paces, left it outside in the rain, snow, and drove it again, and it hasn't fallen apart yet. I thanked him, and I asked to see his welding, and Charles informed me he's never welded. He's scared of fire, and he builds small wooden ships inside wine bottles. Very cool. Thank you, Charles. But last but not least, let's talk to Herb. Herb told me I was wasting my time, and I should quit while I'm ahead. I responded with, thank you, Herb. Do you have any suggestions? I'd like to see a photo of the quad that you are building. And would you look at that? Herb said, I've never built a quad, but I won the state level championship for creating model train universes. This guy knows what's up. He said that the plastic figurines in his caboose kept upsetting the train, causing it to derail. So he knows a thing or two about unsprung weight. Thank you so much, Herb. I asked him what his suggestion was, and he said he would start over buy a new quad with a smaller battery from zero. I said, okay, Herb, no problem, brother. I asked if he was paying for it, and he said no. So it looks like I'm gonna have to call Upstart. Upstart covers the spread yet again, helping Uncle Rich because they view me as more than a credit score, which is nothing like my score on the Cruising USA game at the arcades. Needless to say, they reward you based on your education and job history in the form of a smaller interest rate. They make it fast, easy, and simple to check what your rate will be, and it's a soft pull which is quite frankly the exact type of pull I prefer. See why Upstart is top ranked in the category with over 300 businesses in its trust pilot and swing over to upstart.com slash rich rebuilds to find out how low your rate is in a few minutes so you can fund a build or project of your own. Thank you Upstart for the hookup and sponsoring this absurdity. Let's spin the wheel again, okay, fabrication. That being said, let's dive into some of the building of this quad, shall we? Lee and I last episode mated the motor to the swing arm, and now we're going to pick up where we left off. This episode, we're going to be mounting the battery in the box of the quad itself. Then we're going to split the quad in half to make it easier to insert the battery. We're going to make the mounting brackets for said battery, as well as the battery hold-down strap. Then we're going to get into the overall design of the fairings of the quad, which will be led by Steven. First off, I'm going to invite my two friends, Joe and George, over, and we're going to do some fabricating. That was anticlimactic. Yeah. Oh, let's get the camera. Oh, it's already done. <laughs> it's a rough crowd here. <laughs> You're not allowed to make a two second mistake. <laughs> Down a little bit. Let's go. Yeah. yeah. Those are Harbor Freight blades. You might go through like nine or ten of them. So. Yeah. <laughs>
right, so now we finished up the welding of the uh, quad itself, and this was probably the most quote unquote exhilarating part of the entire build because what we had to do was we had to split the entire quad in half. After we did that, uh, we actually fabricated the brackets that go uh, to the mounting points on the frame of the quad. The front of the quad is steel and the rear half is aluminum. So I could only weld in the front half because all I had access to was uh, to weld steel at that point. So nothing could be welded in the rear because obviously it's aluminum and it's also a lot more difficult to weld on that. After I put the battery box in, uh, one of the main concerns was making sure that it had some accessibility. So this is the contactor box on top and the, the main battery fuse is at the side. I had to make sure that was still accessible uh, in case I had to do any maintenance. The other concern is making sure the battery doesn't slide from side to side. What I did for that was I actually ended up welding some tabs on the outside of this. Uh, to make sure that there's, that there's no side-to-side -side movement uh, when you're ripping around on the quad. The only way as of right now to get this battery box out is to actually to break this right here and slide it off from the side. <laughs> so this is the uh, this is my welding skills. Imp I'm improving welding. I don't care what anyone says. My welding's definitely improving. Uh, there's some spit there, whatever. It's not my damn fault. I blame uh, I blame I blame Harbor Freight for that. <laughs> Oopsie. <laughs> I'm hard afraid for that. So what I did here it looks like a cross, but that's not a cross. <laughs> what would Jesus this, do? This, 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 this is where he died for us since. I just lost like all my religious subscribers for sure. Uh, so right here, this is the actual the battery tray. So this top part goes on right here. Sorry, this is the battery tie down, I should say. This is the battery tie down. This is formed perfectly right on top, and that goes right here. Then what we have here, we have this that goes through that hole right here to secure it down. And what I could do when I tighten the nut down, it further pushes down the battery, making sure it doesn't slide out from side to side. There's some holes that I drilled on top of these steel plates too. And those steel plates are to house the controller. So the controller goes right here, and then I'm just gonna have some screws that go in place right here to keep that steady. I just wanted to tell you guys more about the motor setup. So remember I was talking about before, I didn't know where the hell to put the motor, and obviously, judging by where the battery box is mounted, there's no way this motor that's so large could fit anywhere within this vicinity. So we determined we needed to put the motor on top of the swing arm. That was my crazy ass idea, and I think it looks actually kind of cool. Uh, it's gonna be a very, very short chain run right here. Uh, so there's not gonna be much slack. It's pretty much instant snap and go on this thing. Uh, so there was a piece of aluminum right here. And uh, if you remember in the video carefully, there was a, a very large piece that was still here. I had to cut that because the sprocket was in the way. If you remember, uh, the brake used to be on top of here, but because again, the motor's in the way, this brake had to be relocated to the back, uh, almost the bottom side of the swing arm. Uh, the battery box, that's another tab welded on this side. So again, there's no side to side movement. And then right here for the zip ties, I put these zip ties here because <laughs> that's what's holding the entire bike together. Just kidding. No, there's a, a lot of the electronics are gonna go in here. So the, the main battery board, uh, as well as the DC to DC converter, a lot of those electronics are going to go right here, and I just started forming a small, uh, almost like a small uh, shelf uh, to put those things on top of. But what's actually going to go here, there's actually a pan that, that prevented damage from rocks, almost like a sliding tray that went underneath this that goes from the rear end of the quad to the front, uh, and that tray is the majority of where the electronics are going to live on top of. So in terms of travel distance, that was another big concern that I had as well. Uh, and I actually ended up watching quite a few videos of sport quads and other ATVs going off-road and doing these massive 10 to 15 foot jumps off of dunes. And it didn't look like there was too much travel in the rear. I think full squat, uh, it probably only got to about this point or so, but it's not likely to hit anything. At least I don't think so. <laughs> but even said, even if it does, what I could do is I could, I could adjust the shock accordingly so it doesn't bottom out. And I can also change the rear shock as well if I notice it getting a little bit too out of hand. So what I'm going to do now is this is the under tray that actually originally went underneath the engine. And this is the tray that actually protects the engine against like rocks, scratches, 
and just general debris kicking up and hitting the case. Uh, I actually wanted to coat this with something. So what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to paint this. Uh, it looks a lot better than this kind of like base coat I put on it before. Uh, but I'm going to use Durbac, and uh, Durbac is this really thick, uh, flexible paint. And what it does, it prevents like scratches and chips. Um, it's also anti-rust as well. So I'm going to put that coating at the bottom. Uh, just taking a little bit of this here. Look how thick that is. It's like a bowl of oatmeal. Boy. Boy. <laughs> Look at that. Look, I could barely even spread it. <laughs> this thing is not going anywhere. Look at that. Look at that paint. Real Bob Ross over here. This is I'm literally Bob Ross. A little <laughs> bit of color. A little bit of color. All right, for this, look how beautiful that side looks. This is how it's done. Just like the cyber quad. Light coats. Keep the can moving back and forth motion, just like that. And all your problems disappear, just like that. Just kidding, you still have problems. They're just masked by paint. All right, it's a good first coat. All right, so these are the results of the, uh, the Durabac finish on the bottom portion. And this is pretty much rock solid and it gave it a nice hard textured finish. The only thing now is this came out so nice, I actually want to paint the rest of the quad like this too. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add a little bit of tint to that color and I'm actually gonna go with Durbac smoother finish and uh, see how the rest of the quad looks. I'm probably gonna go with a more of a metallic kind of cyber gray color, mix it with the Durbac and paint the entire quad that color so it stands out a little bit more. Now the Durbac finish came out really nice. I'm glad I got rid of that red, white, and blue. It's all one solid color now and things are looking fresh. This is just the base coat. We have about three or four more coats to go, but I like where things are headed. Now coming up to design, I hate staring at things for a long time unless it's, well, you know, something I'm interested in staring at, but I'm gonna pass this part off to Steven. He's gonna design the fairings. He's like the Franz of the whole operation. All right, so after everybody saw Richard's valiant attempt at artistry in the last episode, he decided to forcibly call me in with Popeyes in hand to do the math. And I obliged. So to reanimate the cyber quad, it consists of using the same 32 images and five videos as the only reference points, since there is less information available on this thing than the Cybertruck itself. To do this, I worked backwards from the knowledge of the Yamaha Raptor's dimensions, being a 72.6 inch length, a 46.5 inch width, and a 43.9 inch height. From there, we can start to visualize how Tesla took the pre-existing frame and then built their own rad geometric Mars rover that was put right on top of it. Measuring out Yamaha's dimension specs, we can graph up the Raptor with each square representing two inches and loosely speculate how the Cyberquad fits in its place. Then, by taking the information of the things that we do know the dimensions of, such as the tires, the handlebars, and the suspension, we can then firm up the reality of the angles and sizes from true directional front, rear, and side images that are available of the quad. After a considerable study of each body line and angle, we can determine the degrees of the front and the rear fender flares, the front stainless steel assembly, and how the rest of the body tessellates with varying scalene triangles. After putting it all on paper like you see here, we can make a bit of origami first before transferring it over to cardboard to confirm if any angles need to be adjusted. Since, when we sourced the zero components, we ended up with the larger form factor of the batteries. Figuring it would be nice to have the extra range, we needed to alter how the battery would fit in the frame and make minimal changes to the angles to accommodate the larger battery pack. And from here, we'll be able to start to play and tie it all together. All right, this is kind of uh, where we're at right now. We're at the end of our shift today. Uh, what we were able to get done is we got the brackets done for the rear uh, fenders. So these are the two brackets that are gonna go at either side of the seat. And we're gonna have the fenders come out this way and cut at an angle. Number two, the biggest thing today that we got done was having the front fender done. This thing was absolutely, this took probably about five hours in itself. So it was a lot of cutting, planning, measuring. Uh, we also uh, put in the new handlebar, put in the low rise one. And the low rise one looks 10 times rather than the mid rise one for sure. So I'm glad we got that in. This, is, this consists of uh, ABS plastic, uh, an eighth of an inch plastic, uh, and then we have the aluminum angle rods that take up these two sides to form the basic structure. And I actually like the way this looks, so I'm, I'm debating whether or not to actually leave it black as is, or whether or not I wanna add the aluminum piece on top of it. Right now, this whole thing is ABS plastic, and these are just rivets that I put in here to secure the plastic 
to the rest of the uh, aluminum shell. So that's that's how we designed that. It's actually a pretty solid design. I'd be surprised if we took the Tesla cyber quad apart and it didn't look like this as a matter of fact well boys and girls i hope you enjoyed this episode we have a lot of work to do we're going to take a quick break in the series while we wait on parts but i have a fun episode coming up for you all as you all may know tesla killed my supercharging access but the next episode is going to be here's why that's one of the best things to ever happen to me Thanks for following along today. As you can see, Wizard! Wizard! Oh, God! Wizard! He's here. The whole YouTube army is here. It is a YouTuber convention. We've got Rich Rebuild, we've got Ben Wiki, Tavares, Frederick, Garage. 